What's up glitches? The first story we're gonna read in today's video is called Do You Believe in Guardian Angels? And then we're gonna read nine more weird, unexplainable stories sent in by fans. So sit back, grab a snack, and let's get weird. <laughs> Hi, Auntie M. Hi. Love listening to all the stories and you thought I'd add mine, but it comes with a question. Do you believe in guardian angels? So my mom had me at 19 in 1990. She lived at home with my grandparents until I was one and she moved into a house just five minutes down the road. The house was always so well looked after and comfy. I do remember happiness growing up there, but something happened when I got to the age of around five. My bedroom had this built-in utility closet. I remember waking up one night and seeing a figure slash man walk out of the closet with a black cloak and a big fedora kind of hat and just stood at the end of my bed watching. It frightened me. I remember gripping my duvet, screaming for my mom, but words didn't come out every time. He would edge closer and closer. But so young, I did go back to sleep under the covers, and it happened quite a few times, but then I randomly made a new friend at my grandparents' house where I spent a lot of time, and I never saw the figure in my bedroom at home again. She dressed different, but was the new neighbor next door, she told me. She had a royal blue floor-length dress with a distinctive, beautiful, decorative white collar neck, and her name is Rosie. She would come and play with me and would just randomly show up, but only when I was alone. She encouraged me to draw mostly. She occasionally showed up at my home with me and my mom, but would just come in. Asked me how I was and we would play, drawing mostly. She never drew though, just watched and chatted to me even when I got paper and pencils out for her. When I was around seven, I had a dream and Rosie was floating above me. I asked why she was floating and she told me, I'm your guardian angel, I'm here to protect you and I always will, but another person needs my help right now and you're safe. And I didn't see her for a while. I missed her, she was good company, but so young I didn't think much of it and I just thought that she'd moved away. Around a year later, maybe, I had another dream, and she came to me and checked in. I asked why she had not been to play, and she said she'd just been watching and told me that she did live next door to my grandparents, but she died in 1921 and was run over by a car. She replayed it to me. It was outside my grandparents' house. I remember vividly. As I got older into my teens, Rosie always stayed with me. When I started talking about her to mom, she would always dodge the subject, but eventually she told me that I would occasionally talk to myself. She'd come in the said bedroom and be so worried, but I would be sat drawing and talking to thin air. She asked me who I was talking to, and I would say, Rosie, you let her in. And apparently she asked if Rosie was asking me to do anything naughty at one point. My response was, no, we're just drawing. And I asked why she couldn't see her. Mom left thinking it was an imaginary friend. I, nor Rosie, wasn't doing any harm. Until I got older and things just got more confirmed as I questioned her existence. I was out one night about 19 in a town 20 miles away. Me and my friend bumped into two women we didn't know and we got to chatting. One of them mentioned that they were from the same village as us. She said her friend was meant to come out too, but she had been having bad experiences at her home in the said estate that I grew up in. I said to them the number of the house I grew up in. Their faces said it all. I said the black bedroom and they said, yes, how did you know that? I asked about the black cloaked figure. They told me in shock it was happening to their friend's two daughters living in that said room. I knew I wasn't seeing things. So with that, I looked into Rosie and her death. Fact is that it actually happened to her. She was eight and was run over outside my grandparents' house. I asked mom about a party I was going to with Rosie when I was little. I remember holding her hand. Turns out it's a picture of me holding a balloon. I still had questions, but it all made some sense though at 19, she was protecting me. The extra confirmation for me was at 21, I was home from university in a different house. I was asleep and woke up to a young, innocent looking boy stood in my bedroom door. I was confused why this boy was at my bedroom door and obviously questioned it half asleep. I remember thinking, what's happening and asking, who are you? But this little boy tried to come through the door frame. As he did, his face would change. It was demonic and very aggressive. He tried a few times, but I remember looking at the edge of my bed and Rosie sat there, not changed, shaking her finger at him, laughing, saying, no, no, no. So I remember laughing at her sass and went back to sleep, knowing I was safe, like she told me that I always would be. I've not seen her since. I'm 33 now. I'm a designer for a living and create in my spare time. It was always in the cards. She protected me and guided me more than I give her credit for and still does to my knowing. Thanks, Rosie. I think that's so interesting that Rosie was a little girl that got killed, hit by a car. So she was just a spirit, but she was also guarding you. She said she was your guardian angel. I don't know much about 
guardian angels, like, can they be people that have passed over? Or is it something completely different? Was she just calling herself a guardian angel to explain herself to you, explain her presence, to be like, hey, I'm here to protect you. Don't be scared of me. I don't really know, but... What a great story, and I'm so glad that she was there to protect you. Thank you, Rosie, and thank you so much for sharing your story. This one is called For the Love of Tulips. When I moved from Los Angeles to the Twin Cities in 2002, I was pretty lonely. I didn't know anyone, and I found myself missing my grandma Arlene, who had passed away while I was living in California. I was the only grandchild who interacted with her regularly. She was very religious, very opinionated, and something of a challenge because she was in pain and just a rather sad person in general. For all her religious beliefs, it always seemed as if her faith brought her very little joy or comfort. We'd also frequently argue because I was more of a spiritual person who liked to meditate, and she said that meditating wasn't talking to God, just talking to myself. (laughs) In spite of our different beliefs, I loved her, and I knew she needed some extra love because she was so prickly. I always remembered her birthday, on Mother's Day, etc., and often wrote to her and sent her cards and gifts. I knew I was her favorite grandchild because I paid attention to her. So I'm living in Minneapolis and decided one night to walk to the convenience store to buy something to drink. For some reason, my grandma Arlene is on my mind as I walk. Her sister Dorothy had been hit by a drunk driver many decades earlier in St. Paul. There's an incredible ghost story there for another time. So I'm thinking about her and about grandma, and I'm remembering the last gift I sent her, yellow tulips. Tulips were her favorite flower. I'd sent them to her over the years in every color. I had such a deep felt pang in my heart thinking of her and missing her. A little tear even came to my eye. I pull it together and go into the brightly lit store to get soda and stand in line to pay, trying to keep my emotions from spilling over in this public place. There's a tap on my shoulder. I turn around and I'm facing a tall man in white pants and a white tunic with long blonde hair. He doesn't say a word but silently hands me a white tulip. I am so shocked. I just stare at it for a moment and when I look up, he is gone. I looked all over the store then run out of the door, looking all around the parking lot and down the sidewalk, but the man is gone. Of course, I call my mom, Arlene was her mother, and I tell her, tonight we had a message from your mom. I tell her the story and we cry together. I will never forget that moment, and I now feel as though Grandma Arlene is always with me. That was a beautiful story. I wonder who that tall man in white was that handed you the tulip. What do you guys think in the comments? Who do you think that was? Either way, there was definitely a sign from your grandma saying hello, and I love that. Thank you so much for sharing. This one is called, My Grandfather Said, Your Mommy Needs You. Hi, Dematrix. Hi. I absolutely love you and love that you have given so many of us a chance to tell our stories. Thank you. I'm so glad. Thank you for sharing yours. I want to give a trigger warning for talk of a stillborn baby and domestic violence. So before I begin, I need to give a little backstory and a little bit of family history. My mom, myself, and my sister have always been extremely intuitive, especially my mom. She's always saying things before they actually happen. She can see things and hear things, and she always knows when someone is pregnant. It's actually kind of scary. The three of us always have similar experiences, and we have so many stories to tell, but I'm going to start with this one. Back in 2014, I was 22 years old. I found out I was pregnant. Needless to say, I was scared shitless. At the time, my cousin and I were extremely close, so I texted her to tell her, and she texted me back, saying that she was pregnant too. We found out we were due a week apart from each other, and we were so excited. I tried to hide it from my mom, but of course she already knew and she kept saying that she had a feeling that someone else was pregnant too, so that's when I told her it was my cousin, her niece. At the time of my pregnancy, I was in a really abusive relationship with my child's father. I was put in a few really scary situations. Like this one time, I wanted to go home and he didn't want me to go, so he was driving around in a section where the speed limit was 25 miles an hour and he was doing 50 miles an hour. When he finally stopped the car, I quickly jumped out, but before I could even take one step away from the car, he was grabbing me by my hair and trying to pull me through the car window. I was four months pregnant at this time. I refused to leave because I didn't want a broken family like how I grew up. I didn't want my child to go back and forth every other weekend like I had to. So I stayed and put up with the abuse. Stupid, I know. My cousin, on the other hand, was in a really good and healthy relationship, and they were together for years, and they had everything going for them. I kept saying I wanted a little girl, and my cousin wanted a boy. We were going to find out what we were having a few days apart from each other. My cousin found out she was having a little girl, and I found out I was having a little boy. We were both disappointed and we're like, of course, we each got what the other one wanted, but we both eventually got over it and we were very excited to raise our little ones together. So like I said in the beginning, my cousin and I were due a week apart from each other. She was one week ahead of me. 
When she was almost 40 weeks, she went in for a checkup appointment to see how her baby was doing, and when she got there, there wasn't a heartbeat. I waited all day for a text from her letting me know how her appointment went, and when I didn't hear from her, I knew something was wrong. I finally got home from work, and my mom told me that my cousin's baby didn't make it. Her baby ended up having a bowel movement, and she swallowed it and passed away from the toxins. Oh my god, I didn't even know that was a thing. I was so heartbroken for her and I felt absolutely terrible. I kept thinking I don't deserve to have my baby. I wasn't in the best place to have him, but she was, so why was this happening to her and not to me? Later that night, my mom told me that she had a dream the night before where my grandfather, her dad, who passed in 2011, was holding two babies, a little girl and a little boy, and he put the little boy down. And the little boy said, what about her? Isn't she coming too? And he said, no, she needs to stay with me and you need to go be with your mommy. Your mommy needs you. My mom told me she had a really uneasy feeling when she woke up and then later that day is when she got the call about my cousin and she said everything clicked right then and there. She said, you need your son. Big Pop knows that you do. Five days later, I went into labor with my son and it was the day of my cousin's daughter's funeral. I felt so awful that she was mourning her baby and I was having mine. When they broke my water, they noticed that my son had a bowel movement and I went into instant panic. All I could think about was I'm going to lose my son too. My doctor told me not to worry and my mom did everything she could to keep me calm. A short while later, I delivered my son and as soon as he was out, a ton of NICU nurses ran in and they were able to scoop out his mouth before he could swallow anything. They did keep an eye on him for a few hours to make sure he 100% didn't swallow anything and luckily he didn't. I know for a fact him and I had many guardian angels watching over us, including my grandfather and my cousin's daughter. He was my saving grace and I definitely needed him to become the woman I am today. I am so blessed and thankful that I have him. My cousin is doing a lot better as well. She now has five children total, if you include her angel baby and her little boy on the way. She's thriving and happy. And as for me, my son is now nine years old and I am in a very healthy, happy and thriving relationship for the last five years. And we have a two-year-old son together. But if it wasn't for my oldest son, I would 100% not be here today. My grandfather was absolutely right. I needed him. I needed my son. And I'm so thankful to have him. Thank you for reading my story. Thank you so much for sharing it. I'm so sorry about your cousin's loss, but I'm happy to hear that she is doing good now. You are doing good now. Everyone's good. And I love that your grandfather knew that you needed him and passed that message on for you. This one is called The Number Three, The Hooded People, and Princess Walkie Talkies. Hi, Dematrix. Hi. I'm a huge fan and love your channel. This is three short stories rolled into one, but I know we like long ones, so enjoy. Okay, it's three different stories. I was like, how are we going to incorporate the number three hooded people and princess walkie talkies <laughs> into one story? But it's three separate stories. So here we go. The number three is the first one. This story starts back in 2019. In February of that year, my dad, who had suffered from addiction, had OD'd and unfortunately passed away. And then three months later, on May 14th, after just spending the day with my mom, I get woken up in the middle of the night by a phone call from my brother, who tells me that our mom had went to sleep that night and never woken up. So we had just lost both parents three months apart. Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. The thing is, is that my mom passed away on May 14th and her birthday was August 14th, so she passed exactly three months before her birthday. But it gets even weirder. Later that year, in either late September or early October, I had this dream. In the dream, I'm standing on my grandmother's porch, and it's a bright, beautifully sunny day. Suddenly, a man walks up to me, and I get the feeling that I know him. But when I look at him, the sun was so bright that I couldn't see his face. All I could see was his body from the neck down. Then he goes on one knee like he's proposing and hands me a simple gold ring. In the dream, I feel very happy and I hold my left hand out to him and he takes it and slips the ring on. And then out of nowhere, he takes a blue ribbon and ties it on my wrist. Then holds my hand up and uses his other hand. He places it on my stomach and says, it's a boy. <gasps> then I woke up. Keep in mind that when I had this dream, I was single and had been for almost a year leading up to that, so I was definitely not pregnant. Fast forward to the end of October, I meet my now fiancé and we start dating almost immediately, and then I ended up getting pregnant early on, almost exactly three months after I had that dream. But I didn't find out I was pregnant until three months along, and you guessed it, I gave birth to a healthy baby boy just like my dream predicted. Now my sister-in-law, who was also pregnant around the same time as me, ended up giving birth almost exactly three months after I did. It was only just recently that I realized all of this and I was curious. So I looked up information on the number three and here is what I found. 
It says that if we look at the pattern of the number three, it is connected to the body, mind, and spirit, the cycle of birth, life, and death, and can represent wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. The ancient Greek philosopher Pythagoras considered the number three to be a near-perfect number and the symbol of the divine. Well, that's nice because three is my birthday number and my lucky number. That's so cool. And that's so cool that you had to dream of the person letting you know, like, you're going to get married. You're going to have a baby boy. Okay, next one. The hooded people. I have had a number of haunted experiences since I was a child, but this was by far the scariest one. I can't remember how old I was, but I was a teenager still in high school at the time and lived with my grandparents. One night it was around nine o'clock. I went outside to take out the trash. Keep in mind that even though I had never been afraid of the dark, I was afraid of my grandmother's backyard. Until that point, nothing had ever happened out there, but any time I was out there at night, which I tried not to be, I always felt like I was being watched and it just felt super creepy overall. Anyways, this night I walked out to take out the trash and we always had the trash cans pressed against the back of the house. I walked over and opened the lid with one hand while carrying a trash bag with the other. I was just about to throw the bag when the hair on the back of my neck stood on end and I got this strong feeling that I should look up. So I did big mistake because what I saw chilled me to the bone. I was standing on the left side of the backyard and directly in front of me on the left side of the yard were three hooded figures. They were the same exact height and all wore dark clothes and hoods so I couldn't make out any details. Not even their skin color. They were just standing there facing me, unmoving. I don't know how I know this but I just knew that they were staring at me. When I saw this I froze dead on the spot terrified. I tried to calm myself by saying to myself that it was just my mind playing tricks on me somehow. I even blinked a few times to try to convince myself, but they never moved. Then to my horror, as I was trying to convince myself they weren't real, the figure in the middle took a step forward in my direction. And it was like my fight or flight kicked in and I chose flight. I threw the bag in the trash and then full on sprinted back to the front and ran inside. I immediately locked the door behind me as I was gasping out of breath. My grandmother saw me freaking out, walked up to me and asked what was wrong. So I explained to her what happened. She looked at me horrified, but then had the nerve to go outside to smoke anyway. (laughs) Even after I begged her not to. When she came back in, she said she didn't see anyone out there and tried to explain it off by saying it was my mind playing tricks on me or maybe some of my neighbor's kids messing around. But the thing is that the neighbor next door had a motion sensor light set up right behind where I saw the hooded figures. And the motion sensor light worked because it would come on for the smallest things, even animals passing by. But what freaked me out is that I realized that when I saw those figures, it never came on, not even when the middle one moved. I know for a fact that what I saw was real. I just don't think they were human. First of all, I want to say we believe you. Second of all, oh my God, (laughs) what do we think those hooded figures could have been? Did you ever see them again? Oh, that is so interesting. Um, Let me know what you guys think in the comments. Like, what do you think that was? Okay, this is the third one, the princess walkie talkies. I have this little sister who was like five when she got these two princess walkie talkies as a gift one day. Fast forward some years later and I was visiting and was looking through old stuff that we had stored just to see what I could find. The living room is big and open and connected to the kitchen. I was in the living room looking in the chest and my grandmother was in the kitchen cooking when I pulled out those pink princess walkie talkies and I held them up for my grandmother to see and said, hey, remember these? And she smiled and said, yeah, I wonder if they still work. So me being me, I turned them on for shits and giggles thinking they probably are too old to even work anymore, but they did. At first I was saying some dumb stuff and pretending to talk into one when all of a sudden the one I was talking into cut on and a deep man's voice came through. I can't remember exactly what he said, but he was going on this long rant about unaliving people and burning the bodies. But this talking continued. He said so much more. I just can't remember it all. And so when this happened, both me and my grandmother froze, staring at each other in horror. And I dropped the walkie talkie onto the floor and jumped away from it like it burned me. The voice stopped, and for the longest time, we stood there staring at each other and it. Eventually, my grandmother, who hates scary stuff to the point where she won't even watch horror movies, tried to explain it away by saying, maybe it just picked up one of the neighbor's frequencies and it was them that were talking. I'm like, if you got neighbors saying stuff like that, then you need to move. Anyway, when I gathered the courage, I threw both walkie-talkies away and the day went on. Fast forward a few more years from now, I had a son of my own and we were just getting moved into our new home. My son, who's only three at this time, had this chest full of toys. One day, me and my fiance were unpacking. I went to take out my son's toys so that they could keep him busy while we finished. And when I took out the chest, sitting on top of the chest of toys was only one of the walkie-talkies. 
When I saw that, I was instantly freaked out. I swear, I threw those away. I don't know what scared me more, the fact that one of them somehow found its way into my son's toys or the question I couldn't help wondering, if we have one walkie-talkie, then who has the other? Okay, I thought this one was scary, like, from the beginning that you heard someone talking about that stuff over the walkie-talkie, although part of me did feel like your grandmother, like, okay, maybe that you were just tapping into something else. But to your point, if you were just tapping in, if there were frequencies crossed and you were tapping into a neighbor or someone nearby who was talking about unaliving people and burning their bodies, that's still not good. But then the fact that you threw those away and one of them showed up in your son's toys years later, I don't know, man, that's weird. That is weird. I am hoping that you threw that one away too. Did it ever reappear again? Those were good ones. Thank you so much for sharing. The next one is called sleepwalking outside my body. So like astral traveling, probably. I don't know. Let's see. Hi, Indy Matrix. Hi. I have a story to share. I wasn't sure what to title this, but it involves walking away from my sleeping body. Astral traveling. This particular thing that happened took place about 11 years ago in 2014. I was attending a Bible college in Minnesota. At this time, it was small and not a big college. Half the students went to basically advanced slash deepen their relationship with God before real college, and the other half were actually seminary students. Anyways, my classes were 8 a.m. to noon every day, and only on Tuesdays and Thursdays, if I remember correctly, there was a mandatory chapel, which basically is like a mini church session before lunch with singing and praying and had announcements, etc. This was important to briefly mention because on those days before chapel, I didn't have a class after the first 8 a.m. class with was only an hour, I always went straight back to my dorm room to sleep before the chapel hour started. There was a time in the middle of the school year that I was really struggling and having a hard time with personal struggles, and I felt like I didn't fit into this place or with those kids. I became depressed and slept a lot and started to miss some classes. It's almost like during that I allowed something sinister or an evil entity to bother me without realizing. When I started to finally feel better and started to try to get my classes and try to do better, this is where the weird stuff started to happen. Like something or someone I couldn't see did not want me attending class or chapel. Here we go with one of the things that happened. I was taking my usual nap before chapel, but this time determined to make it and not skip. I sleep on the top bunk in my dorm. My alarm goes off, I get up, I climb down the ladder, pick out a little jacket, put on my shoes, and head out. Campus isn't that big. Chapel was maybe comparable to a two to three block walk from my dorm. As I'm walking, I get halfway to the chapel, suddenly realize that something wasn't right, and at the same time, I realized or felt off. I felt my body get sucked backwards like flying up and then dropping like that roller coaster feeling dropping back into my body that was still in my bed i couldn't open my eyes i could hear my roommate's faint music and i felt like i was in my bed but i could not open my eyes i started to panic i was going to be late for chapel and get in trouble i realized that i never got up and never started walking somehow it was a dream this realization made me panic more, but it was so real. I was really halfway there, and I distinctly noticed I had to climb down that ladder, and I got fully ready. It felt like I was being held under in sleep. But at this point, I was awake and aware, but could not move or do anything. I was trying so hard to move my lips to make some noise to get my roommates to help, but I couldn't move literally anything. I don't know how long I was lay pinned like that by something or someone it felt like, but my best friend that I had made there came barging in the room making loud enough noises and I snapped fully awake and opened my eyes. I felt this presence leave as soon as the door opened. I was so relieved that I didn't even care that she didn't knock and she usually doesn't, but for that flaw, I was so grateful in that moment. Bless her heart, she came to make sure I got to chapel on time. I never told her what happened, or really anyone. I was wondering, what is that called? I don't know the name of it. I was hoping you heard something similar. Would love to hear what you think. Love your videos. Have a great day. So it definitely sounded like you were astral traveling. And then when you snapped back to your body, it sounded like you were in a state of sleep paralysis. And perhaps there was a sleep paralysis demon around that was holding you down. And that could have been what you were feeling when you said you felt like a presence in the room. Or if you, if you didn't actually feel a presence, you just felt like something was holding you down. That could have just been the sleep paralysis part. Maybe there wasn't a sleep paralysis demon around. I don't know why maybe subconsciously like you knew you had to get to chapel on time and your soul just went there first <laughs> tried to get there and then you got snapped back to your body like whoop. either way very interesting story thank you so much for sharing this one is called Lost Time. Hi, Indie Matrix. Hi. This took place in 2018 when my boyfriend and I at the time lived in southern Mexico in a small resort town for work. 
My resort was first and his was about 12 minutes drive from mine. There was a one-way road to take us to the resorts and a separate one-way road from the resort back into the town. The roads were separated by land with trees. So to be clear, both roads were separate and both one way. After work, six days a week, I would walk across to the other road so that he could pick me up on his way home from work to go into town with his big, noisy pickup truck. On this particular day, he messaged me and he said he was leaving work and would pick me up in a few minutes. I immediately walked across to the other road to wait for him. It would usually take about 12 minutes for him to get to me, but after 20 minutes, I didn't see him and I saw every car that passed me on that tiny one-way road. I then sent him a message and after no response, I called and still... There was no response. I figured I'd just give him a couple more minutes as he could have ended up having to deal with a guest at the hotel before actually leaving. I waited another 20 minutes and as I was about to call again, he called me back. I asked him if everything was okay and told him that I had been waiting for a while, about 40 minutes and I hadn't heard from him. He said that he was in town. I was confused. I told him I had been waiting and I was 100% sure he didn't pass me. He said he was also confused. He only remembered messaging me to say that he was leaving work to pick me up. Then he drove out of the hotel and the only thing he remembered is waking up in his truck in town and he had no idea how he got there. We were both in shock and confused and at a loss for an explanation. He then had to drive back to pick me up and to this day, we still don't know how he got into town as there was absolutely no way his noisy pickup truck had passed me. What do you think? Well, also, if he had passed you, he would have seen you with his eyeballs because he picked you up the same spot like every single day. Okay, it could have been a couple things. It could have been A, some glitch in the matrix, weird timeline jump. Like he just kind of like jumped ahead in the timeline for some reason. I really don't know why that would happen. And you lost the time. B, I mean, less likely, but maybe an alien abduction because that would make some sense too. C, maybe there was a portal of some sort that he like went through and then he like ended up in town 40 minutes down the road. Something weird. 100% happened there. I'm not sure exactly what it is, but those are some of my ideas. I'd love to hear what you guys think about this one in the comments. Let us know and thank you so much for sharing your story. This one is called Quantum Immortality, Timeline Jumping, Paranormal. Hi, Team Matrix. Hi. Thank you for giving us the space to learn we aren't the only ones. Oh, you're so welcome. I have always had abilities. I don't publicize it. I'm surprised I'm emailing this. My abilities change and expand as I grow. I'm almost 60 now and have seen a lot. I have always been able to project myself to other places, no cords. For example, I remember being three and trying to tell my mom I was at school. I remember being five and projecting myself to my grandparents' house. My grandfather saw me and he told me to go home and all I could do was giggle. I could hear my grandmother talking and he said she won't understand, go home, so I did. Oh, so he understood. Oh my God, that's so cool. As an adult, I projected at will and have used it to check on people. I also have real dreams where I'm suddenly another person and only have a few minutes to figure out clues as to who I am to see if I can intervene or it's info only. I get warnings in dreams as well. I can't see spirits normally, but I have experienced many of them through sound, things moving, lights, electrical things. I also work with energy and can heal people and animals when I'm supposed to. I can feel demons. Some telepathy. I started noticing matrix glitches, I think in 2018. My cousin did as well. A screw that fell and disappeared. A lid that fell when I opened the juice in the car and has never been found in that car. Animals there, then not. All of my abilities were much stronger before my probable quantum immortality jump. I spent a year and a half at my parents' house helping with my mother and my husband traveled back and forth. She was on hospice for a year and would phase between dimensions, which led to all sorts of freaky and scary encounters. After she died, I went home with plans to start a business and work part-time with my husband delivery driving. I started setting up the space and we had a blast delivering together. Two weeks in, I was watching a clear channel medium I follow and she suddenly starts channeling and it looks like she's looking right at me, which is impossible, and says there was going to be an accident, which sometimes happens, and it wasn't supposed to be, but God has your back. Everything will be okay. I blew it off because I know I'm going to live to be 90 and I am protected. The next day, we ran some errands with my husband driving. On the way home, the wheel went off the road on the passenger side and got caught on the drop off of the road and the car flipped. We landed among some trees. We live in a rural area and we're one mile from home. I was hanging from my seatbelt and couldn't find my phone. I helped my husband get his seatbelt undone and he found my phone and realized I was having a hard time breathing and used his legs to support some of the weight. I called 911 and then said I had to go and hung up on them and called my sister-in-law who was going to be passing by the accident and I needed to tell her. I heard a woman yell and ask if I were alive and I said yes and I called for help. 
My husband was frail, so when they arrived, they decided to remove the windshield the rest of the way and get him out to the ambulance and then come back and cut me free. I argued with the tow truck driver that I wanted my car at home. I had groceries and they were really expensive. The car is totaled and very scary looking. I started not feeling well and got a ride home. I had one cut on my leg, but that was it. I was in bed and suddenly felt like I was dead. I contacted my friends that can talk to dead people and asked if I was alive or dead, and they all said alive, but they didn't explain what I was feeling. I started noticing other things. I didn't have as many abilities. It was super hard to heal myself. My feet went from a size five and a half to a size seven. That's really weird. I just wasn't as organized. I totally forgot the business and started working at Amazon. My husband was different too. He wasn't as talkative. He asked me what I did with the filing cabinet that he had. He described it and I told him I have never seen that filing cabinet and told him what I remember, which was different than what we were looking at. He had a prior stroke from pushing a lawnmower out of a muddy area at a neighbor's house on a hot day. I talked to the doctor and the neighbor and everyone confirmed it, but in his timeline, he had it from high blood sugar. This was a very confusing period of time. I watched the video you had on Instagram reading a story of a woman who had jumped timelines in an accident and realized that that is what happened. Quantum immortality. My husband died 10 months later from natural causes. He has made himself known. He has been seen. He has moved things, tried to open a door, but it was locked, touched people, sat on the bed. It has been comforting, so I continue to talk to him. I am now back at my dad's house. I started noticing some odd things about myself. Some days my socks are too big. Same socks I've had for two years. I have those little floss brushes everywhere, like purses, car, backpack. I didn't know why. I don't have any gaps in my teeth. I remember yesterday that I did have a gap in my bottom tooth. I woke up yesterday and felt a ridge between my front teeth and my socks fit. Then it hit me. Sometimes the ridge is there and sometimes it isn't. So I called my cousin and told her about the freaky differences and she said it explains why sometimes she has a scar and sometimes she doesn't. We are cycling through timelines. The physical items seem to remain the same, but I need to pay closer attention. In some timelines, I still sew and have energy and write lists, and in other timelines, I scroll and don't remember how to read patterns. I'm going to start taking notes and see if I can match physical attributes with personality attributes. I was curious if anyone else had noticed this happening to them. The end. Oh my goodness. I have not noticed this happening to me, but that is crazy. I can't even imagine cycling through timelines like one time at one moment, you're in one timeline. At one moment, you're in another timeline. Things are a little bit different. That must feel really weird, really uncomfortable. I don't even know what I would do. I also think that's interesting that your mother, when she was passing away, when she was on hospice, she was phasing between dimensions. So now you're phasing in between dimensions. Does this run in the family? Did your mom also have all those other gifts that you had? The abilities? This is very interesting. I have not personally experienced this. Has anyone else experienced this? or have heard about something like this, please let us know in the comments. And thank you so much for sharing your story. This one is called My Attachments and Their Antics. Hi, Team Matrix. Hi. Thanks for giving us all a safe place to tell our stories without judgment or fear. You're welcome. Here goes. I've had a few attachments since I was little. The first one has been with me for as long as I can remember. Never dark or harmful, definitely just a peaceful presence. This attachment is still with me. I'll be 50 this year. In 1993, I got my first apartment. It was a very old, creepy building, looked eerily similar to the Bates Motel, but totally up my alley since I love old architecture and anything creepy, paranormal, etc. The first apartment I moved into in this building was peaceful but falling apart, which leads to the next apartment. The bathroom from upstairs collapsed into my bathroom and the landlord said he felt horrible and would move me into the larger apartment right next to this one and wouldn't increase my rent. Being 19, I took it. When I got the keys, the only thing in this apartment was this ugly but super comfy looking oversized chair that looked brand new. It became my favorite place to relax very quickly. This is important. I became friendly with one of the guys downstairs. I was a party girl, he was a party dude, but we never partied together. I'm not sure how or why he came up to my apartment. The following events knocked that memory out of my head. He looked like he saw a ghost when he saw that chair. His elevated demeanor disappeared immediately. He screamed, get that fucking chair out of this house. I've never heard him yell, ever. He was a very laid back pothead, so when he freaked out like that, it kind of jolted me. I asked what his issue was, and he told me everyone that has owned that chair dies in that chair. <gasps> I thought he was crazy, laughed it off, and kept it moving. 
A few weeks later, my other neighbor came over to borrow some rolling papers, a normal occurrence between us. I had moved the furniture around and this girl saw that chair and had the same reaction as the guy downstairs, saying she put it in the dumpster months ago when her friend overdosed in it. She also said that she got it from a prior neighbor and another prior neighbor told her to get rid of it. Now I'm kind of really freaked out. I was able to get about seven years of overdoses in that chair. Now I'm debating on whether to believe the rumors or just brush it off. Get rid of the chair, man. Get rid of it. <laughs> Later that next night slash morning, I overdosed in that chair. Thankfully, my friend had spent the night and was able to get me help. Immediately, I not only took that chair out of the house, but I burned it. That's not the end of it. Since then, I've had something less savory than my peaceful attachment. It started by playing tricks, bangs, lights flickering, but my peaceful spirit would always make me feel safe and comfortable, so I just laughed it off. This went on for 15 to 20 years. Nothing too major, nothing too scary. About eight years ago, I ended a relationship because it was just so emotionally draining that I was physically weak all the time. About three to four months after he was completely out of my house, things went from silly tricks to more dark things happening. I'd wake up with bruises and scratches all over some of them so deep and in places I could never reach myself. My kids have told me I would scream saying no and leave me alone. The dreams and events have become more and more violent since. My peaceful spirit is defeated. About two years ago, I saw a psychic. It wasn't a planned thing. She was a covering hairdresser at the salon I went to. As soon as I walked in, she jumped back like she had seen a ghost. I never met her before, so I was confused. She told me to sit down in her chair and approached me very cautiously. She asked me how long it was attached to me. I felt the blood drain from my head and my chest was tight and heavy. We talked for about half an hour, more her talking and me shitting a brick. She explained to me that the trickster was able to grow in strength because I was so weak from that horrible relationship. Stronger so much that my peaceful spirit couldn't help anymore and I needed to get help. I thought I knew so much that all I needed was a little ritual. I saged and salt washed my house, but not myself, not sure what made me skip myself. Shortly after this, we moved out of state. The first few months in this new house were peaceful. I was so relaxed, I was thriving for the first time in a really long time, until doors started slamming, cabinets opened and closing, banging and knocks from my closet, foul odors, but only when I was home alone. The crazy dream started again, except now I can see it. It's so strong now, but I just told it every night that it does not have my permission to touch me or my children and stay away from my pets as well. It did not have permission to enter me or my family, and it was to leave me alone. This worked for the dreams, but not the experiences in the house. A year ago, my blankets started to get ripped off of me. When I didn't give the response it wanted, it started grabbing my feet and pulling me to the bottom of my bed. I was getting scratches and bruises again. A guy I had been dating saw the scratches appearing but couldn't see what was doing it. He begged me to see a priest, but I don't believe in God or organized religion, so my stubborn self declined. About a week after we split up, nothing related to this, my daughter and her friend heard me screaming on the top of my lungs, no, stop, get off me, leave me alone, let go, get off me. They came running and they said they thought it was just a normal night terror since I have those two until they saw me struggling to get up with my arms at a T to my torso as if being held down and I could lift my head but the rest of me looked as if I was pinned down but they saw nothing. Immediately they started trying to wake me up and free me. My daughter said it took almost five minutes to get me to wake up, and when I did, I told her to run. It's still here. The thing in my dream was almost werewolf in builds, but much larger, and a humanish-shaped head, but it was a black mist with red glowing eyes. It was using my children in appearance to manipulate me to hold my arms down, and they kept repeating to stop fighting and let him in. They also had the red glowing eyes. When I was awake enough to know I was home in my room, my daughter kept telling me it was okay, and I kept telling her it was still there and she needed to get her friend and everyone else in the house out. Obviously scared, she grabs my sage and lighter, it's in my bed at all times, and lights it, and that thing was gone. Three days ago, it came back stronger than ever. I was fully awake this time. I had just turned the TV off, but I was still playing games on my phone. In a matter of seconds, there was something so heavy pushing on my chest, I couldn't breathe. I was trying to tell it it wasn't welcome and it didn't have my permission to touch me. It grabbed me by the throat and squeezed and I began to give up. I relaxed for a moment and gave it one last giant push and was able to scream, get out. 
My throat was so sore from trying to scream and being squeezed that I couldn't scream for help. So I texted my daughter, help. She came running and asked what the heck happened to my neck. It was bright red in the shape of a hand, but with the thumb and two fingers. I still was struggling to catch my breath and she ran to the kitchen, grabbed the salt water bottle, I always keep it on hand, and the sage and lighter. We just kept repeating, you're not welcome here, you do not have permission to touch us, you are not allowed to enter our being, leave this vessel and leave this home. We saged me, the house, the animals, and everyone who lives in the house while repeating the chant, followed by a salt cleansing of all the walls, windows, sashes, and doorways. I'm seriously considering going to a spiritual advisor to get help. If anything new comes up, you will be the first to know scared and still fighting Carrie. I thought this was going to end. I thought this was a story that was going to end, but it is still going on. My friend, I know you don't believe in organized religion and neither do I, but I do believe that a priest can possibly help. Someone can possibly help. Someone, you need help. You need like professional help. Please get professional help. I want you to be okay. Anybody that knows anyone that can help or if you think you can help, please let us know in the comments. I really hope that you get help soon and thank you so much for sharing your story. This one is called Cousin Tiffany. Hey, Auntie Matrix. Hi. I've been following you for a while now. I love watching your videos. I've even gotten my eight-year-old son into them. I recently told him this story and now a few things have changed for him, but let's get into it. And I apologize for the length ahead of time. Never apologize for the length. I want to start off my story with a little bit of my background. I have had weird experiences, feelings, dreams all my life. I grew up in New York. It was my mom and three siblings. We lived in an apartment. We've been there for as long as I can remember, but at this time, I'm about seven or eight years old. In our apartment, the kitchen is off to your right as soon as you walk in the door, but there is a wall too immediately to the right, right after the door, and then there's the kitchen. Keep note of that. I have had many experiences of being in the kitchen with my back facing that opening of the walkway leading to the living room. Standing in that kitchen, I'd always feel as if people were walking back and forth past the kitchen opening to what would be the living room, but anytime I were to peek my head out of curiosity, there was never anything. I don't know if it was just me that felt this way or if it was other people in my family, but we never said anything about it. I'd feel people standing there and would disappear once I turned around. I've always felt as if I wasn't alone, even if I was alone in the house. Fast forward maybe a couple of months later, I had a cousin who passed away in her sleep suddenly. Her name was Tiffany. And after the autopsy and everything was done, we found out that she was sick and she had had seizures. She and I were very close. When my mom and I would go over to my aunt's house, we'd always be together. I would always stay with her and play with her. She was older than me. She was about 15, so she was like a big sister that actually wanted to be with me, lol. Fast forward to after her passing. One night I fell asleep, or I think I was asleep, but I can almost guarantee that I was fading in and out of sleep. I wake up to her in my bed. And if you can picture someone lying in bed next to you as if they were supposed to be there, hand on her face, laying on her side, and just looking straight at me with a sense of admiration. Remember, I'm about eight, so I'm completely frazzled, especially because I know that she had recently passed and she absolutely couldn't be in my bed, right? So I think that maybe I'm just thinking about her and I rub my eyes and I hope that she was gone. Wrong. And to my surprise, she's still there. And I'm thinking, this cannot be true, can it? So I now put my head under the covers frantically and I hope that when I open my eyes again, that she is no longer there. But when I open my eyes, she is still there. And at this point, she is now under the covers with me. I bolt from under those covers and run into the bathroom where I think it's safe. I'm petrified because this has scared me half to death, causing me to now have to use the bathroom. So I'm sitting on the toilet and I think that everything is over and I put my head down to reach for the tissue straight ahead of me, which is in the same direction as the bathroom door. And when I pick my head up from grabbing the tissue, she is standing in the hallway. She has on a nightgown white with flowers and she has black curly hair, but her hair is in pin curls. And in that moment, I slammed the bathroom door shut. I do not blame you. I don't know how long I sat in the bathroom before I was able to muster up the energy to swing the door open and run into my mom's room to tell her everything. But when I finally did, she was not there and I was very grateful. I ran into my mom's room and tried to wake her up and tell her what was going on, but she didn't budge an inch. She was a very heavy sleeper, so that wasn't anything new. But because she did not answer me, I thought of only one thing I could think of. That was to run back into my room and tell my sister that my mom told me to sleep with her. And that night, I faced my sister in bed with my eyes closed, head under the covers, and did not get up until morning. The end. No, that was definitely your cousin Tiffany was coming to say hi to you. And I guess didn't realize that she was scaring the shit out of you. <laughs> 
in that situation, I know that you were only eight and you would never have known this, but you can tell a spirit like, hey, you're scaring me. Please, please don't show yourself to me. You're scaring me right now. And they should go away if they are a good, regular old visiting spirit. Did you ever see her again is my question. Thank you so much for sharing your story. This one is called Spirit Children. Dear Antimatrix, hi. <laughs> I love listening to your stories and that you give us a place where we all feel free to share our experiences. Yes, this one is somewhat long, but I feel it's worth it. I must disclose that I can see, speak to, and hear spirits. Thank you again for listening. As a single mom who moved frequently, we were always at a new place. So, you know, new sounds, new neighbors, and so on. We had moved in after being homeless for a few years. We had very little furniture and it was a small home, but it was ours. The first few nights were normal and the days were eerily quiet. I was in between jobs and surgery, so some days I was home alone all day. One day I'm sitting in my bed and trying to organize my jewelry, mostly costume jewelry or Mother's Day gifts for my kids. I had my music on and suddenly I heard two or three little kids playing in the living room. But I'm home alone and my neighbors were all 76 to 80 years old with the exception of one neighbor who had teens. But everyone was at school at this time of day. So I jumped up and checked out the living room and just as I thought, there was no one there. I returned to my room and turned my music back on. Within seconds, I hear the kids playing again. They're laughing and now playing with a ball that was lying on the floor. The home was a single story with a basement. There was no slope on the floor and the ball was going back and forth. I didn't say anything and went back to my room. Yes, I could still hear them and the ball was still rolling around. I had a tiny dog and a house cat and this whole time they were both napping on my bed. But now the dog jumps up and then immediately lays down and kind of whimpers which is not like him. The cat, who is much larger than the dog, jumps down and ran into the living room thinking the kids were home and ready to play. I followed him and he saw the ball rolling and was about to bat it back like he would with the kids, but the ball stopped and just stayed where it was. The cat was now afraid and ran back into my room. This has all taken place in about a 20 minute span. So I changed my music and cranked it louder and said out loud, if you kids need a safe place to play, you can stay, which I know you're not supposed to talk to them, but I had had enough and just wanted to finish my task. They played for about an hour and then it sounded like the front door opened and closed. I ran out to see who had opened the door and to my surprise, it was still locked. For the next few days, all was quiet or so I thought. My youngest daughter, who was 10 at the time, came in complaining that her sister was up and playing loudly in the living room. So I got up and I was going to confront my eldest, who was 15 at the time. But to our shock, she was sitting in the corner, holding her knees and silently crying. I quickly made my way to her and embraced her. This entire time, you can hear the kids laughing and playing with the toys. So back in my bedroom, I'm calming down the girls. At the same time, I had to ask the spirit children to be quiet. It was 3 a.m. and I am informed that my girls could hear this every night since we moved in. I had to explain to them that they were just ghosts and nothing to be scared of. The spirit children would come almost daily and occasionally at night for the next several months. I didn't mind the noise during the day, but I could tell that my children were not okay with it. I had a talk with the spirit children and told them not to come back. For about a week, it was quiet. No noises or anything out of the ordinary, but then the first week of Halloween, all heck broke loose. The spirit children were back, but now it was different. They were scarred up and they were crying now. I sent my kids to spend the night with friends and I was determined to help these spirits, so I started doing research. When we first moved to this town, we would walk up to the store and always pass this house. Disclosure, it wasn't there, but I could see it like a spirit that always made me shiver. My girls could not see the house and the empty lot left no clues, but now the spirit children are showing me what happened. I cannot back any of this up, just my experience. It was back in the 20s or 30s, and this stately house was owned by a man who worked within the church, a woman who was always crying, and two kids, a boy and a girl. The father was very strict, and even though it was Halloween, he forbid his children to dress up and participate in the town's festivities. The kids were school-aged, and all their friends were dressed up. The father had left for work, and the kids begged their mom to please let them dress up. She gave in and helped them get dressed up. She left with the children to join the rest of the town, but what she didn't know was that her husband had a change of heart and had purchased costumes for the kids. He got home and no one was there. He was furious that they had disobeyed him and he snapped. This home was a two-story with a large vaulted ceilings and a large fireplace. The father was so enraged, he threw the costumes into the fireplace and waited in the dark corner waiting for his family to return. As they came in laughing and giggling, they hadn't noticed that their father was home and angry. The mom starts up the stairs carrying her daughter as her son drowsily walks up the stairs. Now the father is really mad and he puts into motion how he lost everything. 
He locked the front door with the key and threw it in the fireplace, and then he closed the flue and started a fire. He then went upstairs and cut the throats of his wife and children. He then cut his own throat and sat down, waiting to die. The son and daughter had survived the slash to their necks, but their mother wasn't as lucky. The boy tried to guide his sister downstairs, but the house was filling with smoke, so he tripped over his father's legs. The kids fell down the stairs, and it was at this point the fire took over the home and everyone was killed. The father and the kids were the only ones left behind, and once they had finished telling me the story, there was a loud thunder crash that brought me out of the trance. Odin, you just scared me. Hi, buddy. I was still standing in front of the empty lot, but I couldn't see the house anymore. The spear children then took off down the street, and then I saw the father following them. They ended up at my house, and I then spoke with them and the father and told them to move on. The kids did go into the light and the father tried to stay with me, so I bound him to the house that was gone and we moved about five months later and neither the kids nor any other spirits came in the home. Thank you again for the platform and taking the time to read my story. That is so crazy. Imagine having these little spirit children in your house playing and stuff. I'm glad that you were able to help those spirits move on. And that's interesting that you had to, the father wouldn't leave. So you bound him to the house. How did you do that? What a crazy backstory for the kids and the family. This is a great story. Thank you so much for sharing. That concludes our creepy compilation for today. If you enjoyed this and you want to see more future videos, make sure to hit that subscribe button. But if you want to keep it going right now, you can check out this video or this playlist.